That includes water wells uh, and their, those that may be dry or um, abandoned, uh, monitoring wells, cathodic protection wells, and geothermal heat exchange wells. So this is a real great opportunity to have all this work done uh, as one process to ensure maximum consistency and to really reduce the burden on uh, stakeholders from having to participate in multiple processes. Um, the um, other important point that I wanna make about the scope is that um, there is complete and total commitment, including funding by the Department of Water Resources um, and its state agency partners uh, to complete this um, update. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about the history, and we have had a few fits and starts uh, over the last 20, 25 years on various updates, in large part because of lack of resources, which we have now overcome. Um, the other part of that commitment is this work is reflected in DWR strategic plan, as well as the strategic groundwater management strategic plan. And um, as I mentioned, we have identified and, and provided the funding to make this happen. Uh, you'll hear uh, uh, the details of the schedule. Um, we're really in looking at a couple of year process from, the, from now until we have a final uh, bulletin 74. And along the way, uh, we will have a public review draft uh, for getting uh, additional public comment. Um, at that point, it will uh, the standards and Bulletin 74 will go to the State Water Resources Control Board. You'll hear more about that uh, to help them uh, update and, and uh, prepare the model well ordinance. Um, Partnerships. This is a big part of doing this, in part because of the diversity uh, of the well types and the, the number of state agencies involved and the number of stakeholders that have an interest in this update. Uh, include state agency partners, which you'll uh, hear from shortly, uh, as well as uh, stakeholder partners. And in fact, we've invited a few of our partners to make some uh, remarks after Julie has uh, laid out uh, the, the, the webinar. Um, we have a great multi-agency project team, uh, and I think this is yet another example of how state uh, government is working to uh, better align uh, and uh, work across uh, agencies. So with that, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for participating. I'd like to introduce Julie Haas, who's the project manager for this great endeavor. Uh, and I look forward to working with you over the, the coming months and couple of years on, on this important uh, activity. Thank you. Thanks, Kamiar. Um, I'm gonna pull up my presentation. Did you want? You wanted me to run through the agenda before jumping into your presentation? Uh, no. Okay. But I, I need you to turn over the yep. screen, the sharing to me. Thank you all for bearing with us as we uh, switch over presenters here. Just one moment. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Kamiar, for those introductory comments. Um, uh, I, before jumping in to what we're gonna be doing with the update, our pro planned process for doing the update and how you can participate, um, I wanted um, to, um, to begin in sort of an unconventional way by sharing a little bit about my own background. Um, I've lived in Northern California my whole life. 
I was born in San Jose, and when I was seven, my family moved to the country, to St. Helena, which is at the center of a wine-producing region, the Napa Valley. I grew up on a small vineyard, but my family isn't in the wine business. Um, my dad is a manufacturing entrepreneur. Uh, his early businesses supported the plant nursery industry, and he later shifted to industrial mixing equipment. He's in his 80s today, and he and my mom are still running their small business out of my house. Um, my sister, Amy Haas, is a well-known water attorney in the West. Um, she's the executive director of the Upper Colorado River Commission. And no one is more surprised to have two daughters working in government than my father, <laughs> although he does say he's very proud. So when I came to the department in 2010, um, I had worked for a local government agency, a resource conservation district, which uh, ran a lot like a nonprofit um, with funding from grants. Um, I had worked at a mid-sized consulting firm and a national consulting firm. And my focus in all of that work was on surface water modeling, studying flood flows, dam breaks, levee breaches, that sort of thing. So when I came to the department, I was looking to try something new. And Mike Floyd, who had a history with the well standards, said, I've got just the thing. So he, he started me on a project to update the geothermal heat exchange well standards in 2012, and my experience managing that um, project is how I got this current assignment to update Bulletin 74. And um, when I'm not working for the department, I'm busy taking care of my family. I have an eight-year-old daughter who broke her arm just two weeks before summer break. Um, and when I have spare time, which is increasingly rare, I prefer to be in the water swimming or paddling. So I put myself out there a little bit, but my real intention with this is to make you feel welcome to work with me and with my team on this project. So let's get started. And we've got a great project team at DWR, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about them later. Our external partners have renewed energy in this project. And there's heightened awareness about the importance of groundwater in California. So this current effort to update Bulletin 74 was initiated about a year ago when some of our partners met with our executive office and got a commitment from them to update the standards. Uh, those partners are attending today and I'd like to give them an opportunity to say a few words about what this update means to their organizations. Um, so can we begin with Liz Posibon with the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health? And Liz, we'll unmute you now. Um, feel free to begin speaking. Thank you very much for joining. Sorry, uh, one moment. My apologies. One moment, Liz. Apologies. My apologies. <laughs> Go ahead. Terrific. Um, just confirming you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello? This is Liz Posey Bond. Hi. This, 
I can, I'm one of the attendees. I just unmuted myself. We were all on mute. We can hear you. Okay, terrific. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Liz Posey Bond, and right. I uh, seem I to be share... having some trouble getting Liz on the line. If we could move to uh, Dave Schulenberg and then come back to Liz, that'd be wonderful. All right. So Dave Schulenberg is with the California Groundwater Association. Let's try this. Can everybody hear me? Dave? Or can I be heard? Are you there? Yep. I'm here. You, can you hear me? I have a feeling that I can be heard by the attendees, but not by the moderators. Yes, I think that was the case for uh, me too, Liz Posebon. <laughs> yep, I think so, Liz. Um, but I have a feeling if I start talking, I'm going to get cut off. Um, uh, I apologize. Uh, we seem to be having Sam, some technical can, issues on our end um, at this point. Sam, can you hear me? Back. I apologize if we could go ahead and uh, move through the presentation. We'll come back to the folks in just a few moments here to provide some contextual remarks. All right. Julie? Sure. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and for folks on the line, if you could uh, just tell me real quickly, can you hear us okay here at DWR? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Thank you very much for doing that. I'm going to hand control back over to Liz, uh, or I'm sorry, to Julie. Um, Really just one moment here. Control the screen now. to educate interested stakeholders on the Bulletin 74 well standard testing process, including opportunities to provide input and participate, and also to receive input on our proposed process and timeline from interested stakeholders. Um, so I wanted to point out a couple of things related to these objectives. One is that due to the technical nature of the standards, um, we're not going to be um, taking technical comments today. We, we're, we want you to hold those comments and provide those to us um, as we'll describe later in the presentation. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is that um, we're calling this a kickoff webinar. And you'll, you'll see as I go through that we've been doing some work um, internally, kind of ramping up for the effort since the executive briefing about a year ago. So we're not at the very start of the effort, but we are certainly early in the process. So this is an overview of the presentation today. I'm gonna to start with some background um, so that we're all on the same page regarding the scope and purpose of this document. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the need for updated standards our plan to update them, and ways to participate. So beginning with the background. What you see here is our original legislative mandate from 1949 to prepare minimum standards for well construction. And I'm actually going to read it to you, um, even though I know I'm not supposed to do that because I think it's very important and we use it to guide our work um, and to define you know, our purpose through this update. So the department, either independently or in cooperation with any person or any county, state, federal or other agency, shall investigate and survey conditions of damage to quality of underground waters which conditions are or may be caused by improperly constructed, abandoned, or defective wells through the interconnection of strata or the introduction of surface waters into underground waters. 
the department shall report to the appropriate California Regional Water Quality Control Board its recommendations for minimum standards of well construction in any particular locality in which it deems regulation necessary for protection of quality of underground water and shall report to the legislature from time to time its recommendations for proper sealing of abandoned wells. So we come back to this um, original overarching mandate frequently in our work, and I'm also gonna touch on it later, a couple of times later in this presentation. Would you? Sorry, we're, we're, we're just working on technical stuff with the presentation. It's just showing your presentation notes instead of okay. All right. Um, so since 1949, so were they able to see the last slide? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. So since 1949, the legislature has added several new sections to the code adding more types of wells and detailing the process for implementing the standards. And as highlighted in blue, the current well standards that are in use today were published in 1981, 1991, actually 1991, and the draft geothermal heat exchange well standards were published in 1999. So getting to our purpose, from our legislation we get our purpose, or from the water code we get our purpose, which is simple, protect water quality. So statewide minimum construction and destruction standards are meant to prevent wells from becoming preferential pathways for pollutant movement. And we also get our scope from, those, uh, from the water code. And the water code minimum, mandates minimum statewide standards for construction, maintenance, abandonment, and destruction of four types of wells. Those are water wells, monitoring wells, cathodic protection wells, and geothermal heat exchange wells. And the water code defines those four types of wells, and I'm not going to read them to you, but I'd like to point out to you um, that the devil is in the details, and in each definition, um, there are nuances and exclusions um, that um, may surprise you, may not. And so with water wells, I mean, in addition to extraction wells, and Camier kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, it also includes water injection wells. So those um, meaning things like um, aquifer storage and reco recovery injection wells, or stormwater injection wells, which are sometimes called dry wells. Um, and then there's some exclusions here with oil and gas wells, and dewatering wells, and, and wells used for stabilizing hillsides. So for cathodic protection wells, the definition is provided. It's, um, these wells protect underground infrastructure subject to corrosion with the use of a sacrificial anode. And there's an exclusion you see in here. Um, the standards only apply to those types of wells in excess of 50 feet deep. Um, so for monitoring wells, as expected, they're for monitoring groundwater conditions, both level and quality. And geothermal heat exchange wells, these are um, wells that are used to heat and cool buildings um, by circulating fluid for heat exchange with the ground in a buried system of pipes. And you'll see some temperature restrictions um, included in the definition there. So I encourage you to, if you're interested, to, um, to refer to the law, to uh, read the definitions in the law, in the water code, 
and we've summarized those in this California laws for um, the four types of wells. We have a pamphlet. Um, there is disclaimer language at the beginning that you know if you want the official law, go to this um, link down below, legginfo.legislature.ca.gov. But this pamphlet, I'm pretty sure, is up to date. We, we last um, updated it in 2016 following um, the SIG SIGMA, the passage of uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, so in addition to defining our purpose and scope, the Water Code defines the process for implementing um, the standards, that is taking them from recommended standards to enforceable regulations. So here's a, a brief summary of that process. A D DWR develops those minimum recommended statewide standards. We submit them to the Water Resources Control Board. They then adopt them by reference in, through their model well ordinance. And then cities, counties, or water agencies, um, whatever is the local um, jurisdiction, adopts a local well ordinance that's at least as stringent as the statewide standard. Then local enforcing agencies, which are typically the County Department of Environmental Health, administer and enforce those standards. So I mentioned the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and a lot of folks wonder how, how does this impact the well standards? So SIGMA is a very important piece of legislation for our state, moving us towards sustainably managed groundwater. And though there is a, definitely a strong nexus between SIGMA and the well standards, um, which I've summarized in some bullets here. SIGMA didn't change or amend the purpose, scope, or process of implementing the well standards. So, um, so they're the two are they're separate but related in these three ways. So this first bullet, SIGMA defines sustainability as the avoidance of undesirable results for each of the six sustainability indicators. Water quality degradation is one of those indicators. So proper well construction is going to help prevent the introduction, introduction and spread of contaminants in the aquifer system. Um, SIGMA reaffirmed the authority of the local enforcing agencies to issue well construction permits. Um, they also um, gave authority to groundwater sustainability agencies to regulate groundwater extractions and new well construction to meet the sustainability objectives established in their groundwater sustainability plan. And finally, SIGMA and setbacks. So SIGMA addresses uh, well interference of so setbacks from um, uh, what, between wells, well spacing in relation to other wells, and stream depletion, so setbacks to streams. And historically, Bulletin 74, the well standards, have included minimum separation distances from potential sources of pollution. So because of this nexus, we're going to coordinate closely with the, you see SIGMO here, that's our sustainability, Sustainable Groundwater Management Office um, on these related issues. And although these are out, considered out of scope for the well standards, um, we will reference any applicable guidelines at the time of publication. Julie, I have one clarifying question. Uh, a participant is asking what LEA stands for. Can you just... Oh, thank you very much. Um, LEA stands for Local Enforcing Agency. And typically those are County Department of Environmental Health, but they, they can be um, within a, you know, a, a division within a water agency or water district or within a city government. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. 
And so I encourage you to keep our perspective in mind, that is DWR's perspective in mind, um, as you formulate your comments and recommendations for the update. We can only develop standards within our legislative authority and that means we can only address standards as they relate to groundwater protection. Um, we are updating standards for those four types of wells, um, but we will also consider um, recommendations related to other wells because of this overarching mandate we have um, to investigate and survey conditions of damage to groundwater related to all wells. Um, so finally, we are developing minimum statewide standards. So they won't address every scenario uh, and they are intended to be adaptive to a variety of conditions. Um, yeah, so this is just something to keep in mind so that when you send us your comments, they, they'll have a higher likelihood that we'll be able to address them in the well standards if they relate to these to our, our scope and purpose. Okay, so um, I wanted to finish off this background section with a return to the importance of the well standards. Um, this figure is also a good segue to the, our next topic, which is the need for updated standards. Uh, I worked with our graphics office to update an old textbook figure that I stumbled upon on the Water Board's website from 1995. And, and I really like this figure since it shows exactly what we are tackling um, with the well standards. So if you take a look on the on the far left, you've got um, here I can see it. you've got a public supply well. Um, that's pumping and it's sort of dominating the flow gradient um, in this image. So you can see all these blue lines are flow path lines and they're all kind of um, pointing from the right to the left um, towards this public supply well. And you see with this, in this image we've got these, um, what the geologists call layer cake geology. So it's very, um, it's sort of idealized or simplified. And you've got this upper aquifer and, and the lower aquifer. And they're labeled on, on the far right. And then you have a contamination source. It's this leaky underground storage tank in the middle. And you can see the contaminants um, uh, you can see by the density of these brown dots uh, where the contamination is greatest or, or less. And we can what, you can see how it's flowing through um, these wells. Um, so next to the public supply well, there's a shallow domestic well that's contaminated that's just tapping into the upper aquifer. Um, next to that, just to the right of that well, there's a well that's screened in both the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer. Um, and it has a gravel pack that's continuous through the, the entire um, length of that well. And you can see with those blue lines how contamination can flow down through the well. Um, the same is true for the well to the right. And the three wells um, on the far right of the picture are um, decommissioned wells, or as we call them in California, destroyed wells. Um, the, the two um, wells with the wavy lines um, show destruction through placement of a clean backfill, clean fill in the center of the casing up to the surface seal zone and then there's an impervious plug placed on the top with this sort of mushroom cap in those two wells and then the the well on the, mo the most <laughs> to the far right is destroyed through um, complete sealing top to bottom and the casing has been perforated as showed with the shown with the blue lines so that 
ceiling material has been pumped out into the annulus. And you can see, you know, of course, with that well, there's no um, transport of flow through, through the well annulus, which is the space between the casing and the borehole, or through the casing itself. Um, so I think it's really, it's a really important figure which kind of describes, um, you know, what we're doing here, how wells can act as um, conduits for, for uh, contaminant flow. So at this point, did you want to break for a few questions? Sure, yeah, Wonderful. If there are questions. Yes, um, so we've received three questions so far. Uh, the first is whether a GSA can prevent the issuance of a well construction permit. Um, I think that's true, but I'm, I'm not working. I can, we can get back to the person asking the question. I, I don't work for um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office and I'm not that familiar. But from my reading of the, the Sigma, the, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, yes, based on this um, basin-wide assessment and the sort of cumulative impacts of the wells, they can uh, prevent a well from being constructed. I think, and I think that's what you showed. Great, thank you. Um, another one I think is uh, just a very specific question uh, about sigma and stream setbacks and the individual is looking for the uh, section, uh, the actual code section. Um, I assume we can get that offline to folks, but I don't know if you know it <laughs> offhand. No, okay. no, I'm not sure. We'll follow up with that uh, separately. Um, and then finally, a comment. Uh, as I understand, the state well standard will be minimum uh, leaving local agencies to establish more stringent, uh, presumably regulations or restrictions. While this sounds, uh, this sounds good, but it's difficult to interpret the rules across the state from county to county. Um, so just a comment that I'm, I'm sure uh, folks here in the room are aware of. That's true. We um, sort of by design, the well standards are the minimum for the state and then um, local agencies can adopt something more stringent. That's kind of in recognition that local conditions vary quite a bit in California. And so um, this, the, this law leaves it up to the locals to sort of customize the requirements for their own particular needs. Thank you. Um, and now one question, I know we had tried to get uh, some of your partners on earlier. Would you like to give them the opportunity to speak? Yeah, I would love it if you came back on. Okay. Try this again. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, so Liz, uh, you had been speaking earlier. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, just verifying that you can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Yay, all right. Uh, well, my name is Liz Posibon, and um, I represent uh, the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health. I chair a committee um, in that association, a water and land committee, and the California Conference of, of Directors of Environmental Health, or CCDH uh, for short, um, is an association of all 62 environmental health directors and also other associate members uh, throughout the state of California. And we oversee a variety of environmental health programs, including the permitting process for well uh, construction um, in our local jurisdictions. And uh, we really appreciate uh, Julie's efforts and the efforts and support of her uh, supervisors within DWR to initiate this process um, that we started uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, we worked uh, collaboratively with the California Groundwater Association and, and other stakeholders through a technical, a voluntary technical advisory committee since uh, 2010 to develop some recommended uh, changes to the well bulletin standards. And, and we certainly agree that this is a very good time to initiate this process to update the standards, particularly as the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act legislation is starting to be implemented. 
Um, so thank you again. And uh, also um, uh, thank you very much, Julie, for your continuing efforts with our association. Thank you, Liz. Great. Uh, David Schullenberg, are you there? Can you hear us? David, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Everybody, my name is Dave Schulenberg, and I'm the Executive Director for the California Groundwater Association. And just wanna take a real quick moment here to share with you some information uh, regarding the CGA and the uh, work that they've done on this, uh, the standards in the past year. Uh, the California Groundwater Association was founded in 1948 and is a nonprofit organization, including membership from all sectors of the California groundwater industry, including water well drilling and pump contractors, manufacturers and suppliers, engineers and geologists, and members of the com regulatory community. An overall goal of the CGA over the years has been to protect California's groundwater through such activities as periodic educational seminars and workshops and preparation of standard practice articles on technical subjects related to water well drilling and construction not necessarily discussed in earlier versions of Bulletin 74. These articles are available to anyone interested and are found on the CGA website. Involvement by the CGA Standards Committee in preparation of these standard practice articles led to interest in 2010 in participating along with the California Conference Directors of Environmental Health in preparing a new draft of Bulletin 74. And lack of funding at that time, staff retirement prevented the California Department of Water Resources from undertaking revisions of Bulletin 74-81, its successor, Bulletin 74-90, and the 1991 draft geothermal heat exchange well standards. Although the need for updating and combining them into one document was acutely recognized. Accordingly, we were request, uh, the CCDEH was requested that their uh, Water Well Advisory Committee convene a subcommittee for this task to include not only members of the uh, Water Well Advisory Committee, but also members of the CGA, who had uh, promoted the need for revising Bulletin 74 for several years previously. For a period of three years, the Bulletin 74 Revision Subcommittee, composed of volunteer members from the water well industry and regulatory agencies, met periodically and diligently discuss topics and issues of concern in updating the bulletin, resulting in a draft version four document issued in September of 2013. The intent was that while this document was unofficial, it would be useful to the water well community in providing up-to-date information and eventually would be incorporated into an official revised bulletin 74 by the DWR. Now, this time has come and we commend Julie Haas, PE, and staff of the, the DWR for commencing this undertaking. And if there's any assistance that our membership can provide along the way, they only need to ask for it. So thank you very much for allowing us to participate in this and we look forward to helping in any way that we can. Wonderful, thank you very much, David. Um, let me just do a quick check. Uh, we have one additional speaker. Uh, uh, so I'm going to unmute at this time, John uh, Bort. Uh, one moment. Hello. Oh, one one moment, Scott. Sorry. Uh, so I would ask, I would ask everybody who's on the line to mute themselves on their end, uh, with the exception of Scott. So uh, Scott, go ahead and take it away. Uh, hello, uh, this is this is Aaron Button. Actually, I'm I'm, I'm uh, stepping in for Scott and for John. Bitch, I'm playing three people today. You guys hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so yeah, you know, we just uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, for taking this so serious. This is really important. Uh, water, obviously, wish you our full support uh, in moving forward with large undertaking, and that we will be here for any. Uh, any that obviously Julie and her team has. Um, I know is earlier, but uh, once the WR go ahead and finish up these well standards, they'll come to us, and then we will uh, 
responsible for up our model well ordinance and we will be moving forward with that everything thank you uh, and I, we really appreciate it thank you absolutely okay um, so at this point we'll go ahead and hand it back over to Julie to continue the presentation uh, one moment Julie okay there you go Right, so um, I want to talk about the need for updated standards next. Um, the current well standards, as I mentioned before, were published in 1981, 1991, and 1999. Um, as you can see here, the Bulletin 7490 um, was never finalized and was published as a supplement to Bulletin 7481. So they have to be sort of cobbled together to be used, and that's um, cumbersome. Um, and then the fact that both the 7490 and the 1999 geothermal heat exchange well standards are draft um, has raised a lot of questions about um, what the authoritative uh, standards are. Um, and and. There's also the fact that a lot has changed since 1991. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, and as our um, external partners have alluded to, uh, the CCDEH, in cooperation with CGA, completed a thorough word-by-word uh, -word review of the standards between 2010 and 2013. And since we held that executive briefing, um, they regrouped and revisited um, those recommendations and um, su submitted a formally submitted a set of um, comments to DWR um, this January. And there were a total of 130 comments. And I have an example here on this slide. You can see um, their red line comments. And then they, um, I mean, they're, they're um, red lines of the text in the standard, and then their comments are on the right and um, kind of explaining their thinking. Um, so, uh, to give you a sense of those comments without going through each one of them, um, I grouped them into four categories. Um, there's the low hanging fruit, the no brainers. Uh, needs technical review and needs further research. So low-hanging fruit are comments um, related to uh, updated definitions and requirements to conform to current language in the water code. Um, you know, for example, the, the current Bulletin 74 doesn't include some of those definitions that we went over earlier of the four types of wells. Julie, there's one clarifying question, yes, yes. Um, and that's just whether or not the uh, red line documents and changes to the bulletins will be available to those who participate in the SAG and presumably publicly as well. Yes, they're, I think they're referring to the CCDEH comments. Yes. Yes. Um, we are working currently to um, post those on, on our website or to find a way to post them. Um, we recently um, um, have a have a requirement on our web, on our web page to um, comply with state laws for accessibility, and so we are trying to post them in a way that's accessible um, to everybody. Um, and yes, definitely, we'd like them to be out there. And CCDH and CGA have given us permission to post them. It's just kind of figuring out how we can do that in a way that meets the, the new law. Wonderful, thank you. So other low hanging fruit are like updated references to ASTM standards. Some of the standards, the ASTM standards we reference don't even exist anymore. Um, and then, you know, there's like references to the California Department of Public Health and all of those functions have been transferred to the Division of Drinking Water. Um, 
the no-brainers are things like uh, making the standards consistent with other state requirements where appropriate. For, and I have here some examples. The on-site waste treatment system standards include some setbacks. The American Water Works Association um, standards are, um, are required by the Division of Drinking Water for Public Supply Wells, so we would like to be consistent with those and with OSHA requirements for ex excavations. Um, I've also listed here under no-brainers, um, although it might be low-hanging fruit, but uh, recommendations that are outside of our scope. So we talked about, you know, protecting groundwater quality and those four types of wells. Um, so things that fall outside of that um, scope um, I've included here as a no-brainer. So then there are items that need um, further technical review. A lot of these were flagged by the CCDH and CGA. Um, and I've listed some of them here. This is a partial list. Uh, separation distances, minimum seal dimensions, length and thickness, sealing materials and placement, vaults and pitless adapters, surface pad, concrete base, uh, destruction standards and methods, length of screened interval that was specific to monitoring wells, conductive fill and concrete, slot size, drilled hole size, and watertight covers. Those were specific to cathodic protection. So that just gives you a flavor of those items that um, CCDH and, and uh, my project team identified as need, needing further technical review. Um, and that's different than this final category, which is needs further research. That's as in new engineering research, um, where we feel that there's just um, gaps in the current state of knowledge. And for those, we're going to flag those items, and we will likely um, prepare a white paper with recommendations to address those issues that require that we feel require engineering research. So as my team and I have gone through the CCDH and CGA comments, um, we've made some observations about um, the current Bulletin 74 standards. Um, those standards assume, they appear to assume that conditions won't change. So groundwater quality conditions today are assumed to be the same as groundwater conditions 50 years, 100 years from now. Um, they assume that sealing materials perform um, equally well independent of soil moisture conditions. Um, they contain ambiguous language. Um, some of the language is um, like, you know, based on intent or uh, language like, you know, the word adequate, um, things like that that can be interpreted differently by different people. Um, and then they're based on past best practices and experience. So I just want to show you um, in this graphic um, what a well, a very basic well might look like um, that complies with our current standards and where some vulnerabilities um, have been identified. So under the current standards, you know, this well might have an operating life of 25 to 50 years. If there's no known pollution in this upper aquifer and lower aquifer at the time of construction, you can build the well with a continuous screened in both aquifers and with a continuous gravel pack in the annulus that connects both of them. That is if there's no known water quality concerns. And then, of course, it shows here the 20 to 50 foot surface seal depending on um, the use of the well and a five foot transition seal typically with bentonite chips. So also under the current standards, when that well is eventually destroyed, and um, the lifespan of a destroyed well I have here is forever. So even though it's out of sight and out of mind, it's still, this um, infrastructure is still under the ground. Um, 
food. So if they're at the time of destruction, there's still no concerns about groundwater um, quality, groundwater contamination in these two aquifers, um, it's, it's acceptable under the current standard to fill the casing with clean fill material, pervious material, and then capped with a impervious um, material from in that surface seal um, zone. So and then you see the little mushroom cap that's, that's buried beneath that, um, the soil at the top. So those are the current standards. And the vulnerabilities, some of them that we've identified um, with this, come from the Nebraska grout study. So first of all, that upper, that surface seal, or sometimes referred to as a sanitary seal, um, we have requirements for sealing materials and standards, which include bentonite-based sealing materials and um, cement-based sealing materials. Um, some of those, the Nebraska grout study highlighted, desiccate and crack in the unsaturated zone. Um, in this little graphic, my, my graphic artist has this, this blue lens up here in this, um, the upper zone. So maybe in this case, it's staying moist enough not to crack, but it typically, there's a significant unsaturated zone in many areas. And so we're, we have concerns about that sealing material um, not performing as expected. So also, can, we know conditions change. So this upper aquifer might be um, contaminated over time. And then the way this well is constructed, that contamination can easily move through the well itself or through this annular um, zone through the gravel pack. Similarly, in a destroyed well, you know, if you're using the um, the um, approved sealing materials, you might have desiccation and cracking in that upper surface seal. And then if conditions do change, um, that well can be a conduit for those contaminants. That said, there is a lot of good in the current standards and no one has asked us to completely overhaul them and I've actually had people say good things about them. So building on recent activities, um, so this is all relative recent activities. These activities, um, you know, date back, I guess the GHEW standards update began in 2012. Um, so they're pre, um, the, they're before this current effort was initiated um, and since the last um, standards were published. So in 2012, we initiated an update of the geothermal heat exchange well standards. And that project was not completed. Um, I, we worked on it until about 2015, and we lost funding. I can't, I can't remember how many times we lost funding, but we lost funding ultimately. And it's been shelved at about, I would estimate it's about 90% complete. But that process is foundational to the current update. Um, at that time, we engaged key stakeholder groups, um, such as CCDH and CGA and industry experts. We established a stakeholder advisory group, um, which I view as a very successful um, a stakeholder process. We met several times as a group we hashed through the complete draft text together. We all learned from each other. Um, there were unexpected outcomes um, and the standards were much improved from that process. Um, we did identify some key issues and research gap, notably um, research gaps. Uh, notably, um, we became familiar with the Nebraska Grout Study. We actually had representation from the Nebraska Grout Task Force on the SAG. Um, and, but there are some differences between that effort and what we're 
embarking on now the bulletin 74 um, at, at the bulletin 74 standards unlike the ghw standards have been in wide use for over for over 30 years um, and so our stakeholders are very familiar with what they like and what they don't like about the standards with with the pitfalls if you will of the standards um, which is in contrast to the GHEW standards, which were not in wide use. And then the scope of this project is obviously much larger. So um, the Nebraska Drought Study, as I mentioned, we sort of became familiar with it through the GHEW process. It's a seminal study showing that many approved droughts in the bullet in Bulletin 74 were desiccating in the unsaturated zone. And so in about 2015, maybe 2016, without funding in sight for updating the well standards, we published a statewide sealing advisory, which is um, it's on our website um, if you want to look that up. Um, so I'm sorry, the statewide sealing advisory reflects some of the findings of the Nebraska Drought Study, and it was actually reviewed and approved by the Nebraska Drought Task Force members who were serving on our staff. Um, so um, we've received, um, in 2016, we received an offer for funding that could only be used um, to, to hire a contractor to do uh, research. Um, it couldn't be used for internal staff, for instance, to update the standards. So we recognized that at some point we'd be, we would be updating Bulletin 74, and we needed to know more information about um, the issues that were raised by the Nebraska Drought Study. So we hired UC Davis through an interagency agreement to look at sealing materials in more depth, um, excuse the pun, um, to confirm perceived gaps in knowledge. That just snuck in there. I did not put that in there <laughs> intentionally. Um, and so they looked at sealing materials and placement. They looked at minimum seal lengths and um, setback distances through surveying what was being done around the country. And our project team is now leveraging that work. So it was a good investment. And that work, uh, I, I want to mention that that was done um, by a, a graduate student, um, Kim Miles, who was working for Thomas Carter. Do we have time for a few questions? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Okay. So we have received uh, just a few questions online here. The first is, will dry wells for stormwater capture have different or separate regulations? Um, and the user just mentions they seem like a necessary component to ensure resiliency during drought periods. So specific to stormwater capture wells or forced right. injection. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, dry wells do fall into the definition of a water well um, per the water code that I showed you earlier. Um, so they need to be addressed in our standard. Um, I'm currently serving uh, on a technical advisory committee on the State Water Resources Board's um, Dry Wells TAC, I think they're calling it, which is looking to develop guidance for um, st stormwater injection wells. Um, one of the reasons I'm on the tag is we need to coordinate these two efforts so we don't, hopefully, don't end up with two different sets of standards. Um, our plan going into it was that um, the Bulletin 74 would address everything underground, um, and then the, the state board's process would address pretreatment and siting related to water quality. And so together we sort of have the complete package. Um, because their project is, their timing is a little bit ahead of ours, we will just keep coordinating with them 
we're learning a lot from serving on their tag that we, we can incorporate into our standards. Um, so that's the plan right now is that we will address them in our standards and we will coordinate with the water boards. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, will there be any statewide requirement to bring legacy wells up to current standards uh, based on new activity to the well? And the examples provided are, you know, such as deepening or alteration of the well. Well, the, well, the well standards um, do address or will address um, modifications to wells, such as deepening and alteration. But in terms of um, requiring older wells to come up to our standards, uh, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. We haven't addressed that yet. Um, I hope that we can provide some guidance to people into how to, if they have a problematic well, how to um, uh, remediate that. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned, okay. Um, and then finally, just uh, a comment um, and more of an action item than anything. Uh, the user mentions that UC, uh, the USDA NRCS has practice standards for live, livestock water wells for uh, well decommissioning. And uh, NRCS would just like to share those with you, with you and your team. Um, so we'll put you in touch after the meeting. Thank you so much. Yeah. And then uh, just one thing, a few users mentioned the importance of using the Nebraska Grab Task Force study. Uh, so great minds think alike, and uh, obviously you covered that in your presentation. Great. Yeah. And that's the extent of the questions for now. Excellent. Thank you for those questions. Um, so let's get into our proposed approach and timeline for updating these standards. We have a vision, and our vision is updated well standards that are enforceable, protective, and based on current state of knowledge and best practices. Um, and there's a little subtext there that we're not going to be doing new research. However, as I mentioned, um, we anticipate having a secondary product, a white paper with recommendations for additional engineering research. So progress to date, and this means since the executive briefing, that was about a year ago, um, I think it was in May 2018, um, we formed the DWR project team, we received and reviewed the CCDH and CGA recommendations, and we started desktop research, and we've done quite a bit of outreach. So um, executive support, um, at our, our May 23rd, 2018 executive briefing, CCDH, the State Water Boards, and DWR met. Our executive committed to updating Bulletin 74. The water boards committed to supporting DWR and adopting the model well ordinance that they referred to earlier. Um, and CCDEH um, subsequently submitted updated recommendations in coordination with CGA. Uh, Julia, there's a couple of requests just to speak up a, a little bit. Oh, I'm can. sorry. That's okay. Thank you. And so we also have received programmatic support. Importantly, we have um, SIGMO committing to funding the well standards update through completion. Um, the work is being managed and executed by my division, the Division of Statewide Integrated Water Management. Um, and we have a project team um, from multiple divisions within DWR. Um, and they're shown here, SIGMO, Operations and Maintenance, the Division of Engineering, DSWIM, um, and the Division of Integrated Regional Water Management. And here is my project team. Um, they, I'm very proud of my project team, and I have a lot of 
phase that we're going to um, to get these standards updated and there, it's going to be great um, for you. <laughs> right now I'm, I sound like Trump, but it's going to be great um, because of this, this great team that I have. So here they are. I'm not going to read all their names to you, but you can see we have um, a lot of uh, engineering geologists, engineers, and we even have our cathodic protection um, uh, specialist. So in total, we have 212 years of professional experience. And just to highlight some areas of my team's expertise, um, in design and construction of all well types um, that we deal with, groundwater exploration and development, site investigations, geophysical logging, cathodic protection, permitting, groundwater remediation, and well destruction or decommissioning. So to date, our project, has, our project team has been working on reviewing the CCDH and CGA comments, um, and then taking those items that I identified as needing further technical review and doing desktop research um, on those items and developing, we're working on developing some uh, tech memos on those. And all of that will feed into content development for the updated draft standards. Um, and we've done some capacity building, um, like site visits and brown bags, and we'll continue to do so, and outreach. So I wanted to highlight some of our, our outreach efforts. Um, we have a commitment to robust outreach and engagement. Um, we want to share information and um, education with our stakeholders. And we're holding these kickoff webinars today to let you know how to participate and to engage with you more. Um, we've been attending professional conferences and um, giving presentations. We have a new email service. Perhaps some of you have signed up for it already. Um, it was included in the announcement for this webinar. It's also on our, there's a link on our website. And um, that's a listserv or distribution list you can sign up for to get announcements. We updated our web page um, and we, um, we were seeking engage, uh, alignment of local, regional, and state agency partners. Um, we plan to have future stakeholder meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, workshops, and webinars. So this engagement and related activities, there's a couple. One I mentioned is the, the um, State Water Board's dry wells tag that we're involved in. And we're also in touch with the American Water Works Association, which is in the process of updating their standards. Uh, Julie, there's yeah. one question online. Um, one of your bullets mentions a new email service for announcements and updates. That's not a specific address, is it? It's a listserv that folks can sign up for? It is. I, and I think this is a live link. Should I click on that? Um, yeah, go ahead. Hopefully we won't <laughs> foul things up here. Um, yeah. So um, while we're getting that loaded up, so uh, this, no, go ahead. Yeah, if you click on that link um, that's on our website or in the announcement, it'll bring you to this page. You can add your name and email address, and then when we have announcements or status updates, you'll get those. Right. So uh, again, the link to sign up for the listserv is available on the uh, Bulletin 74 website. Right. Um, and this presentation, I assume, will also be posted after the session? Yes, we can post Great. the presentation. We're definitely posting the recording of the presentation. Yes. Right? <laughs> okay. Thank you for the question online. Thank you. So, oh, and I did want to mention, um, I just wanted to, um, Thank Lauren Bisnett from our Public Affairs Office. She's here today. 
for helping with so much of the, these uh, outreach efforts. You know, everything from updating the web pages to getting all these announcements out. Um, she's really been key um, to keeping me on track with um, staying in touch with our stakeholders. Our plan moving forward. Uh, one, some, sorry, one yeah. one question. Apologies. No um, so it's more of a logistical question, but one user is asking where information uh, is being posted regarding drywall, uh, the drywalls tax and related actions. Is that oh, you know, I'm not sure because I'm part of it's a it's a um, it's a technical advisory committee, and we are, we've just been in communication with the boards through emails. Mm -hmm and we've been holding meetings. I can put them in touch with the lead from the water boards on that. It's Matthew Freeze, and I can um, provide that contact information. That would be wonderful, thank you. Okay, okay so our project life cycle and milestones moving forward are, um, we're soliciting feedback. This is um, why we're here now. Um, we're going to develop draft content for the expert panel to review. We will convene the expert panel. Through that process, we'll develop a public review draft. Then we'll hold a public review process. So we'll final the standards, submit them to the water boards. Um, we, DWR will participate as needed in the model well ordinance adoption process. And we will provide training. Um, to local enforcing agencies and drillers and other stakeholders in these new standards. Um, so just a few words about the expert panel um, process. We haven't defined it in detail yet. Um, we will uh, work with a, a, a facilitator to design that process. Um, but it will be based in part on the GHEW SAG um, process that we, we feel was so successful. Um, so the purpose of the expert panel is to sub supplement the expertise of our DWR project team, to offer a range of insights and perspectives, to review draft content and provide feedback to us, to learn from other members of the expert panel, to engage and achieve a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts, and to have a positive experience, and to inform the advancement of industry best practices and recommending needed research. Um, our timeline um, for completing the project. So we are here drafting content, forming the expert panel, designing the expert panel process this summer. This fall, um, we're going to convene the expert panel and develop content under their guidance. We'll prepare a public review draft. Um, about a year later, we anticipate we will still be working on finalizing the public review draft after completion of the expert panel work that's shown here. We'll re release the public review draft in the spring of 2021. We'll incorporate comments from the public review process and finalize Bulletin 74 in summer 2021, providing them to the water boards in fall of 2021. Um, and then as I mentioned, we'll participate as needed in the model well ordinance process. Um, in past conversations with the board, they said they, they anticipate that process will take at least a year. Um, and in the meantime, we will provide training and local assistance in the new standards um, between the fall of 2021 and spring of 2022. So in wrapping up here with uh, ways to participate. Um, so I keep um, reaching out to you, saying we want your comments. This is, this is um, we're, what we're looking for now are comments and recommendations about the existing well standards. 
what you would like to see changed, what you think is important about those so that we can incorporate those into the update. Um, there will be opportunities with the public review draft. We're anticipating holding workshops at that point where we'll present our proposed draft content and get your input on that um, later. So at this time, we're looking for comments on the existing standards. And um, we've developed a, a comment portal, which I'm going to I'm going to try to pull it up just so you so you're familiar with what it looks like. That will allow you to comment to make general comments or to comment on a specific um, section of the well standards. Um, so just to give you a flavor of it. So what um, well standards document and section are you commenting on? Where you can say bulletin 7.90, um, select a type of well for all wells, um, enter a document section. We'd really appreciate it if you could, the more information you could pr provide here, the easier it will, it will be for us to, um, to address your comment. And then you enter what your comment is, um, and then you can provide an email address, and this may be important if we need clarification about your comments. Um, and uh, Julie, is there a deadline for these comments, or is, will it be open? It's open, yeah. But we would like, you know, the sooner the, the better for us, because then they'll have more time to look into the comments and address them but it will be, it's been open and mm -hmm. And uh, one, one question that a, a user had is, uh, will the link to, will that link to the comment portal, is that posted to the Bulletin Standards website? Yes. It is, wonderful. Um, so I also, um, I have this review, the CCD, HCGA comments. Somebody asked about that earlier, and we mm -hmm. talked about it earlier. We're hoping to post those on our website or to get them out um, to you, um, so that so that you so we're not we're sort of not reinventing the wheel. If you look at their comments and you agree with what they say, you can you can let us know that. Um, I think I think it will be of interest to a lot of you to see what they put together. They put a lot of thought and time into it, and they have a lot of expertise behind those comments. So if you don't want to use the portal, um, just contact us and ask us for other ways to send comments. You know, you're, you're welcome to email us comments, um, call us and talk to us, um, send us um, hard copies. Um, but we hope that you use the portal because it'll make it more efficient for us to address your comments that way. Um, and then another thing of note, um, we, we opted for this, um, these kickoff webinars um, because it, it seems to be what people prefer now um, to, to join this way. You're all busy, it's easier for you to you know, log in than to, to travel to a central location and meet in person. Um, and, but that said, if you have organizations that you um, belong to and you have standing meetings, we are more than happy to come to you um, to give you an update to talk about your concerns. So let us know. Um, when, when those opportunities arise, and we'll do, do what we can to be there. So in summary, um, we want your input, um, deep, shallow, or downright boring, we dig your input. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> Love puns. Yeah. I can't read that the well standards really lend themselves to puns, so. Um, but in all seriousness, this is about um, getting your input. Um, we want to hear from you. This is very important. 
this project and we want you to hold us to task. Um, so thank you from all of us um, with the Bulletin 74 project team. Uh, this is us, here's a link to our website at the bottom, there's our URL. Here's my email address and the general email, you can use this, bulletin74 at water.ca.gov. You might get a response quicker if you email that um, because it doesn't just go to me. I, I didn't put my team members' email addresses because I didn't um, get a chance to ask for their permission. <coughs> so I just want to, yes, and I want to say thank you again for joining us today. Are there any further questions, Sam? Um, nope. Not at this time. Yeah, so this is uh, Kamyar Gavechi again. Thank you, Julie. Uh, and uh, Sam, that was a great overview of the work we intend to do over the next couple of years together. And uh, I think everything that was needed to be said has been said, and we look forward to uh, interacting with you and again we'll be repeating this webinar next Tuesday for colleagues uh, who may not have been able to participate or if you dug it so much you can get a repeat. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, thank you all for attending. As we mentioned uh, there'll be a recording of this session. We will also record the uh, the meeting on the 25th or the webinar on the 25th and those will be posted to the same well standards update webpage. So uh, please do uh, tune in there. There is uh, one question, one final question here before we close out, uh, just asking how people can sign up for the SAG. Is that oh, group still open and available? The expert panel? Uh, I think the stakeholder advisory group specifically. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're not reconvening the geothermal heat exchange well SAG exactly as we did before, but we will be convening an expert panel that will include all four type representation for all four types of wells. And there will be more information on that. We're sort of designing that process right now, and um, we'll keep you posted. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. That concludes the webinar for today. We will talk to you again very soon. Take care.